Good evening, and uh, welcome to our service here at the Tron Church this evening. Let me read to you some words from Psalm 100, a psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It's he who made us. We are his We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Some of you might remember when we were studying Deuteronomy chapter 28 that one of the reasons God gave that his people would be judged, would be cursed, would be ultimately sent out of the land was this. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart. How about that? Serving the Lord is not enough. We have to serve him with joyfulness and gladness of heart. That's what that psalm is saying. So we're going to consciously sing a song, a psalm for giving thanks. And uh, the words are on the screen. It's very familiar, but we're having a more joyful tune than we often sing this to because it needs to be sung as a song of thanks.
Well, let's, let's give thanks and pray together. Let's pray. Thanks be indeed to God. And, O oh Lord, our Father, we have so much to thank you for. You who made us. We're yours, your people, your flock. You own us, as it were, twice over because you created us and, and now you have redeemed us, paying a great price for us in the blood of your own. And so, gladly and with great thanksgiving, we give praise and we bless your name. And as we've sung, we know that you are good, so good, so right, so true, so full of grace and mercy and loving kindness and beauty, creativity, wonder. It grieves us so much, O oh God, when so many in the world around us seem to think otherwise, as though even to talk of God was evil, that you are the source of what's wrong in this world, not what is beautiful and right in it. That so many feel that even those who speak of you and want to share your name with others are, are evil, are, are wanting to suppress others, wanting to deny them freedom, liberty, and yet, O oh Lord, the truth is that true liberty is found only in you, only in knowing you, and only in knowing your ways, knowing your love, which is life and not death, which is freedom and not bondage. Just as the sign for a one-way street shows us the way to life, not the way to harm and disaster and death from running into something enormous coming in the other direction. Your law is the law of life, of liberty, of happiness, of joy, of inheritance, of all that you have longed for your people to have and in your grace and in your mercy have made it known to us and supremely made known in the flesh of your own Son, in our Lord Jesus Christ his words and his ways, exemplifying beyond any other the sheer beauty of heaven itself, the sheer loveliness of humankind as human beings were created to be in your glorious image with all your beauty, with all your perfection, with all your righteousness. So, Lord, we pray. We pray for our nation. We pray for our city. We pray for our friends and our relatives, our loved ones, those for whom we long that they would share the joy that we share in knowing you through Jesus Christ, your Son. We pray for the leaders of our cities and our nation, for those who bear the rule over us under your hand in our parliaments, in our courts, who make our laws and who uphold our laws and apply them. Open their eyes, we pray, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, to the wisdom and the beauty and the wonder that is in your law, that is in your perfect word to man. And help us as your people to shine brightly, to show that beauty, to show the wonder of a better way. We should be truly in the midst of a dark world, shining brightly as stars in the firmament, that your church should be not a, not a place that is scorned and shunned, but seen for what it should be, a pillar and buttress of truth, not only proclaiming the truth of heaven, but living that truth so as to shine forth the love, the beauty, the light of heaven, wherever we are, wherever we speak, whatever we do. Lord, we are so conscious as your people that the task you've given us is so great and that our hearts are so wayward, our minds are so weak, our lives so often fail to reflect 
the true beauty of our Lord and Savior. Forgive us, we pray, and help us. Strengthen us. Empower us, we ask, by your Holy Spirit at work in our hearts, opening our minds and our hearts to your guiding word day after day after day and leading us in the power of your Holy Spirit that we might indeed walk in your steps and so lead others to see the beauty of our Savior. That's why we're gathered here this evening, Lord. We know that we need you. We know that we need your word to our hearts directly from the Scriptures. We know that we need one another to hold each other to that, to help each other, to encourage one another, so that together we might walk in your ways all the days of our lives. So draw near to us, Lord, we pray, as you've promised to do, as we draw near to you in faith and in obedient trust. Open our hearts, we ask. Open our minds and fill us afresh with your spirit divine. So hear us, Lord, in this our evening prayer. Grant us the desires of our heart because we ask all with great thanksgiving and in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I do want to welcome you this evening, and uh, if you're visiting with us, uh, especially if it's your first time, then uh, let me say you're very welcome indeed. There'll be uh, tea and coffee, refreshments served after the uh, end of the formal part of the service here at the front and also downstairs in the foyer areas. So do stay behind if you don't have to rush away. It's an important time, just as the formal part of the service is, to be meeting one another, encouraging one another, helping one another, and uh, we, we love to do that. If you were here this morning at our uh, joint service at Kelvin Grove, you'll have picked up uh, one of these uh, leaflets that give all the notices for the church life this week. If not, they're on the, uh, the trolleys just outside the doors here. Do pick one up. There are numbers of notices there that you need to know about, and uh, we trust you to, to get them and uh, to uh, take note of all of these things. Just let me remind you one thing, that uh, this Wednesday is the evening of our fortnightly uh, prayer meeting, we meet together all across the congregations here at Central at 7.30 to pray together for our, the work of Christ throughout the world, especially for our many partners working throughout the world and um, uh, our own church life here and many other places. So do join us at 7.30 and uh, help us as we pray together as one church. Well, we're going to sing again now uh, before I hand over to Paul to read the scriptures. You'll find it in our blue books this time at number 723. Number 723, a reminder that all that we hold dear and so often build our lives upon is as nothing compared to knowing our Lord Jesus Christ. Number 723.
Well, do please turn in your Bibles to Revelation and to Revelation chapter 2. If you're using one of the blue uh, visitor Bibles, that's page 1028. Revelation chapter 2. And last week we were in chapter 1 of Revelation, which, as we read, is a letter. It's a letter to uh, the seven churches in Asia. And in chapters 2 and 3, we have, as if you, if you like, letters within the letter. So there are seven letters here in chapters 2 and 3. And tonight we're looking at the first one to Ephesus. So chapter 2 and verses 1 to 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from... Please turn that off. Let me go back to verse 2. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance... And how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. And do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. May he bless it to us this evening. We turn now again to our hymn books, and we sing number 894. This is a passage that commends the church for many things, but he calls them to return to the love they had at first. And so we sing a hymn that reminds us of God's great love for us, and that we might tune our hearts to sing his grace. Number 894, come O fount of every blessing.
musicians will now play for us as the offering is uplifted. And as I do that, perhaps you might want to read again those verses from Revelation chapter 2, which we'll be thinking about a bit later in the service. So the offering will now be uplifted. Father God, we thank you for all your abundant provision. You are a good and generous God, and you delight to give good gifts to your children. And so, Father, we do pray that as we give out of what you have given to us, we pray that these monies, in addition to our time and talents, would be used for your glory, would be used wisely for the work of proclaiming the gospel, not just here in this place, but further afield with partners all around the world. And Father, as we come to your word, would you kindle in us your fire of love? And Lord, how often that dims, how strong the power of sin in our lives, but you are more powerful still. So work in our hearts and lives through your word to us this evening. Feed us now by your holy word and help us to respond in holy obedience that we would be fruitful and loving servants in your church, that we might bring glory and honor to our Savior. And so we ask this in his name and for your glory. Amen. We turn again to our hymn books before we uh, come again to that passage, and it's number 737. O matchless beauty of our God, so ancient and so new, kindle in us your fire of love, fall on us as the dew. Let's sing together number 737.
Please do have Revelation uh, chapter 2 open there in front of you, and we'll be looking at these opening verses together of this letter to Ephesus, Revelation 2. Now, what do you think about your church? What is your assessment of it? You may think that the buildings are lovely, really nice people. You have your views on the heating levels, don't we all? The music is not quite to your taste, but the coffee is excellent. Now, our assessments of church are often pretty trivial and superficial, aren't they? Which is not to say that some of those things don't matter, the heating is important. But how often do we really think about serious issues, issues of eternal consequence, And even if we do think about those things from time to time, often it's just from our own personal viewpoint, isn't it? A far better question, a question that we must ask is, what does Jesus think about the church? What does he think about our church, this church? What is his assessment? And that is a question that this passage answers. These couple of chapters, as I've said, are Jesus' assessment of his church. As we saw from chapter 1, Jesus walks amongst his churches, tending to them, speaking to them. He knows them. He knows what is really true about his churches because he is in the midst of them. He's tending to them all the time. He knows them. And in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, we have these seven letters. And each one is addressed to specific churches in what we now call Turkey. And they're addressed in the way that you might deliver them as you go around from Ephesus right the way around. And whilst these letters do address real issues in those churches in the first century, they would have been read by all seven churches. And indeed, Each of the seven letters ends with the same refrain. You see it there in verse 7 of our 
letter this evening. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's plural, churches. So each of these letters was more widely applicable than just the one it was written to. But not only were these letters for all seven churches, they are also of universal application. The very fact there are seven is significant. The number seven signifies completeness and wholeness. And so these letters are applicable and of great value to the universal church throughout this age that we live in. What Jesus says to these specific churches is of relevance to all of the church and in every age. And that is not to say that what Jesus says is true of every individual church at all times. He's not saying that. But what Jesus says in this first letter to the church in Ephesus will be true of some churches in the world today. It may even be true of our church. And if not true today, then it might be five years down the line or ten years down the line. So let's look at this first letter, the letter to the church in Ephesus, where we find Jesus' assessment of it. And three points this evening. First, Jesus knows his church toils for true teaching. Second point, Jesus warns his church that doctrine without devotion leads to death. And thirdly, Jesus tells his church that the remedy is to remember and repent. So first, looking particularly at verses 1 to 3 and verse 6, Jesus knows his church toils for true teaching. And we see here that no good work goes unnoticed. Jesus knows his church because he's in the midst of it. He sees everything they do, verse 2. And that is picking up an aspect from that breathtaking vision of Jesus we saw in chapter 1. And here in the letter to the church in Ephesus, it begins with these words about Jesus walking in the midst of the lampstands. I know your works, says Jesus. Jesus knows the truth about the church. And so he can say with the utmost authority, those words we read there in verse 2, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Now, wouldn't those words have been such a great encouragement to the church there in Ephesus? Ephesus was a tough place to be a Christian. Ephesus was that great, impressive city. On several major trade routes, it was prosperous. But it was also a city steeped in pagan religion. And it was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the great temple of Artemis, which dominated both the skyline and the religious life of the city. To be a Christian there in Ephesus was tough going. But they have been faithful. That is clear, isn't it, with these words from the Lord. And they're tender words, aren't they? Full of warmth. He assures them that he has seen their works, their toil, their patient endurance, their refusal to tolerate evil, and especially false apostles. And they're doing it for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 3. They patiently endure all this for Jesus' sake. Look on to verse 6, where we see that they hate the work of of the Nicolaitans. Not entirely sure who they were or what precisely they believed, but they perhaps were a group who encouraged a bit of dabbling in the pagan religions, occasional attendance at the Temple of Artemis, a toleration of the sins of the city perhaps. But the church there in Ephesus would not tolerate the untruth that the Nicolaitans were peddling. They challenged it, they hated it, they distanced themselves from it. The church in Ephesus toiled for the truth. And that is something to be commended, and the Lord Jesus commends them for it. You see, they held to the exclusive truth that Jesus is Lord. There is only one God in heaven above. And they were willing to say that salvation was not merely through Christ, but to be found only through Christ. How relevant is that? 
The liberal media won't mind you talking about Christianity and Jesus so long as it's presented as an option, as a way, as a truth. But claim that it's the only option, as the only way, the only truth, well, you'll be showing the door, won't you? You see, those who toil for the truth know that Jesus knows. He sees. He sees those small stands for truth as you take, as an individual perhaps, in the office or in the staff room or over coffee with a friend. Jesus knows. He sees your willingness to toil for the truth. And that ought to be a great encouragement for many today, shouldn't it? Particularly here in Scotland, many churches, many Christians have taken a bold stand against a national church that has departed from the truth. Many have been willing to take a painful stand, a costly stand. But know that Jesus sees that. The church that toils for true teaching will have to pay the price in this world. It may cost prestige. It may cost certain privileges. It may cost partnerships. It may cost pounds. It may cost property. And for many, it has cost those very things. Prestige, gone. Privileges, gone. Partnerships, gone. Pounds, gone. Property, gone. But Jesus knows. Jesus sees. He sees your willingness to stand for the truth. He sees your patient endurance. He sees your refusal to grow weary. He sees your willingness to insert that little word, only. Only through Jesus is salvation found. There is only one God. He sees that. And his opinion is the only one that matters, isn't it? The one who, adjured, the one who will judge all things at the end of history. His opinion then, that's the only one we'll care about. His opinion is only one that matters. Jesus knows his church when it toils for true teaching. He sees that in Ephesus. He commends them. But that is not all, is it? There is a very serious and sober warning. And this is our second point. Jesus warns his church that doctrine without devotion, it leads to death. That's verses 4 and 5. We see here that no sin goes unseen or ignored. Lampstands need a lot of tending and care if they're to remain a light. I don't know from personal experience, but I think that's the case. If you want a lampstand to shine brightly, or even your fire at home, you must tend it. And that was the priest's job back in the Old Testament days, keeping the lampstands lit in the temple, shining bright. And constant attendance was needed to do that. And the Lord Jesus likewise, as we've seen, tends his lampstands, his churches. He does what he needs to do to keep them shining bright. And that means, as he cares for his church, he doesn't merely commend what is good, but he also corrects what is wrong. Just look down again at verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Jesus puts his finger on the issue. Yes, this is a church that loves doctrine. It's been willing to stand for the truth, to endure hardship for the sake of the truth. But it is a church lacking in devotion, in love. It loves doctrine. But does it love the Lord? And notice where it will lead to, if unchecked. Look at the end of verse 5. A failure to repent will lead to Jesus coming and removing the lampstand from its place. In other words, there is a very real prospect that if this church continues in this way, it will cease to be a church. It will end. It will die. That is what the removal of the lampstand means. Jesus is not speaking here about his return at the end of the age. He's not talking about a second coming, but he is rather talking about 
his temporal judgment in this age. Churches that drift from him, he will end. The light will be snuffed out. They will cease to be. So these words are no mere suggestion. They're not kindly advice. The warning is far, far stronger than that, isn't it? Far more serious. But what could that mean? What does it mean to have abandoned the love that you had at first? Well, it must mean, mustn't it, that the church had abandoned its real love for the Lord Jesus, first and foremost. But also for others, for people, both internally within the church and also externally. Their love had cooled first towards the Lord, but also on the horizontal plane. And let's, as we think about this, not be too quick to individualize this rebuke. This is a letter addressed corporately. This is a corporate sin there in the life of the church in Ephesus. The church, together, had abandoned the love it had at first. In its zeal for truth and doctrinal purity, it lost sight of the goal of doctrine, namely, of right relationship with our Creator, with one another, and to the watching world, to those who do not know Him. Truth is not an end in itself. It is rather to lead us to the God of truth. It is to lead us to love him and serve him and serve others. Now, Jesus is not, he's not rebuking them for their zeal for truth, not at all. He's not saying that concern for truth will always lead to becoming cold and unloving, no. But that is certainly a possibility. It must be why the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians warns this way. He says, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mystery and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. Paul saw the danger. There can be a love of doctrine that actually excludes a love for the Lord. And we can all think, I'm sure, of individuals and churches who are so intent on right doctrine that almost no one meets their high theological standards of doctrinal purity. It's a total lack of real humanity and love. And you know it when you see it. And that seems to be the situation here in Ephesus. In their fight for truth, they've become an unloving church. Now, is that true of our church, we must ask. Has concern for truth pushed out real love for the Lord? Has a particular articulation of the truth become the thing for us, such that we look down on those who don't quite get it? They're not really Christians. They don't quite get where I'm at here. Have we set such a high bar of doctrinal orthodoxy that genuine believers fail to pass the test? They don't quite articulate their faith in quite the right way that we deem sound and satisfactory. They don't use the right evangelical jargon. Do we subconsciously have our bar of entry into the church higher than that of the Lord Jesus? You see, it's not about using the right evangelical language or using the right formulas. Plenty of religious Pharisees had that, didn't they? But they hated Jesus. They hated him. But blind beggars got up and followed, wanted to be with him, loved him, wanted to be amongst his people. That's what matters. That's real faith. Has love for the lost been trampled by concern for doctrinal correctness? Has the church or an individual retained the outer framework of a living testimony when, in fact... The heart of it has died. Yes, the work goes on, but it's no longer a work of faith. The labor goes on tirelessly, but it's no longer a labor of love. The Lord Jesus exposed the sins of the church at Ephesus. And do we dare pray that he would expose ours? No doubt. They thought they were going well 
We're fighting for the truth. We're patiently enduring. But Jesus saw more then, and he sees more today. He asks them and us, do you love me? Do you love me? That was the question Lord Jesus put to Simon Peter, wasn't it? After his denial, the Lord Jesus put his finger on the issue and asked, do you love me more than these? And so he asks you today, all of us, do you love me? He sees everything. No sin goes unseen or ignored. And it's a strong rebuke, isn't it? But his rebuke is not a hopeless rebuke. It is a rebuke to bring about repentance. Remember that Jesus tends his churches so that they'll keep a light, keep shining forth in the midst of darkness. And so our final point, Jesus tells his church that the remedy is to remember and repent. Verses 5 and 7. Look down at me at verse 5. Jesus says to his church, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. Jesus is calling them to something that is doable. They've done it in the past. Did you notice that? They had a love which they've abandoned. And so the call is to remember those days, Do the works of love you did back then. Remember why you first loved Christ. It's a call to repent. That is to acknowledge, to see themselves for what they really are. To acknowledge their sinful lack of love. To confess it before the Lord. To seek his forgiveness. And so receive his forgiveness. And then do the works they did at first. So it's not an unachievable, unattainable standard that Jesus is calling the church to. No, it's not. And perhaps, as we read verse 4, it really grabbed you by the scruff of the neck. Perhaps you found yourself really worried and shaken up by that verse. Well, know that if that's you, you are not in a hopeless position. Let your grief bring you to repentance. Let it be a godly grief and not a worldly one. A worldly grief leads to tears and tears alone. But godly grief, well, it hears God's call to repentance and knows that he's gracious and that all who call out for mercy, he will not turn away. So the Lord Jesus appeals to them, to you, to remember, to repent and to return. He calls them to return. And this is wonderfully down to earth and pragmatic, isn't it? The key to rekindling that love that's been lost is not to whip up some sort of emotional response or vague, ethereal, lovey feeling. No. Rather, it's to do the works you did at first. It's to live an obedient life. That is how we love the Lord. Which is not to say that there won't be an emotional response. God is not anti-emotion, and nor should we be. But it is not merely emotional. It's not reduced to that. We primarily love the Lord through our actions, don't we? That's what the Lord Jesus said. Those who love me, will they obey my voice. So it's our love for him, for the Lord Jesus, and for his people, to those around us in the church, Serving them, doing them good, showing genuine concern for their spiritual welfare, showing hospitality. That is one way we show love for the Lord, how we love each other. Take one example of showing love to one another. I wonder what sorts of things you talk about with one another after the service. A loving church will be one where those conversations cover deeper matters. Of course, you might well talk about the rugby or upcoming holidays, but if you never ask each other searching questions, you must wonder if there is a love issue at root. If you're never concerned enough to ask someone how their marriage is really going, 
If you're never concerned to ask why someone's been absent for a few weeks from church. If you're never concerned to ask how someone's getting on in that difficult situation at work. If you're never concerned enough to ask how someone's love for the Lord is. If you're never concerned enough to ask those deeper questions, then you'll need to ask yourself, am I really loving my brothers and sisters here in the church? At the end of a service, do you talk about the wonderfully doctrinally correct teaching from the pulpit? Or do you talk about the Lord Jesus, whose doctrine it is? Do you talk about the great plans and programs of the church? Or do you talk about the Lord Jesus and your love for him? You see, our words so often betray our hearts, don't they? Return to the love you had at first. That is Jesus' call in this letter. And this return to real love for the Lord, for one another, is what, in verse 7, conquering looks like for this particular church. That is the constant appeal in all these seven letters. He appeals them to conquer, to overcome. And that will look different in each of the next six churches that we consider as we go on. Conquering doesn't always look the same. But for this church, the church in Ephesus, this was the issue. And for them to tackle it, for us to tackle it, is the path to great blessing. Look at what Jesus says, what he promises there in verse 7. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Jesus wants his church to enjoy eternal life, not death. That is what he wants for his church And so he calls us to simple faith, to obey his commands, to remain faithful and persevere, to return to a love we've perhaps abandoned, return so that we'll receive by faith the promise of life eternal. Jesus knows his church. He knew the church in Ephesus. He knows every church in the world today. He knows this church. He walks in their midst. He tends them so that they will endure and receive the full blessings of being with God for all eternity. No good work goes unnoticed. No toiling for the truth goes unnoticed. But no sin is unseen. But no repentance will be wasted. Don't let A love for doctrine, push out love for the Lord. Doctrine without devotion will at least to death in the life of a church. So ask the Lord Jesus to help you, all of us, to love him as we ought. That is a prayer he will answer if we ask him to help us to love him. Be thou my vision. O Lord of my heart. That is our prayer, isn't it? May it be our prayer as a church and each of yours individually. So let's ask for his help now. Let's pray. Our Father God, you know your church. You know your people. You see right into our hearts. You see into the heart of this church. You see into my heart, every one of our hearts. And Lord, where we are to be encouraged in our stands for the truth, would you encourage our hearts? For Lord, where perhaps we've cooled in our love for you, Lord, help us to love you. Help us to return to the love we had at first. That we might love you with all of our hearts and serve you with great joy and gladness. Help us to that end. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we close our time together by singing.
the hymn that is on the screens. And may this be our prayer. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Naught be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my life. Let's sing together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. <laughs>